Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us. You know, harvest will soon be here on our farm, and right after that, we're going to begin doing some strip tillage. We'll talk about strip till on today's show. We're also going to discuss potassium. Now, it's important to look at potassium parts per million on your soil test, but it is equally important to look at the base saturation potassium levels on your farm. We've got a tough to control weed of the week. That'll be coming up a little later in the show. We've got an iron talk too, but first, here's our farm basics. You spend all year working hard to get as much yield as possible at harvest. The last thing you want to do is put your grain in the bin and have it spoil before you take it to market. Introducing the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. Designed and built by a farmer looking for a low-cost monitoring solution for existing bins, the Grain Temp Guard tracks temperature and humidity with an alarm system to alert you when your grain exceeds safe thresholds. For more information on a system for your bins, visit farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk about chopping corn heads. Well, we get a lot of questions about how do you handle the residue on your farm? You're raising pretty good corn yields and even going continuous corn sometimes. And that's just going to be a challenge for me. I can't deal with all that residue. So well, we thought we'd talk about today. One of the first things that we do at harvest time is use a chopping corn head to size up that residue into smaller chunks. Now, if you're a non-farmer, you might say, what doesn't every combine when it's going through the field kind of chop up that residue? Well, there are different degrees of how much it chops it up. And the whole thing is there are a lot of combines without this chopping corn head that are gonna leave residue standing pretty tall in corn. Now, is a chopping corn head important for soybeans or for wheat? No, it's not this real big deal. But for corn, it really is because you've got enormous stalks. And if you don't do something with those, then a lot of that residue can be left in the spring. And a lot of the reason why is, well, like where we farm, we're harvesting right before freeze up in the fall. Or and, after freeze up. <laughs> yep, and then we are going to try to plant right as the ground is thawing in the spring. So there's no heat in the middle to break that residue down naturally. That's why we have to mechanically break the residue down. Okay, let's talk about a couple of things. I wanna first talk about how does this residue actually break down? When you think about a corn stalk, it is a lot of carbon and not much nitrogen. And for all the soil microbes that are gonna decompose that residue, they need some more nitrogen into the equation. And when you think about the microbes, where are they? Well, they're in the dirt, right? They're in the soil. So if we can get more soil in contact with more corn stalk, we've got a better shot to break that residue down quickly. And that's what we're doing by chopping it up into small little pieces. Now I've exposed a lot of surface area on that corn stalk and we can get some soil microorganisms working on the stalks to break them down. So that's one of the big things. The other thing that you have to think about is let's just say you didn't. Let's say you left great big long chunks of stock out there. Not only is it harder for those microbes to break them down, it's going to be hard for us to pull a planter through there and get these big chunks of yep. material to move Exactly. Through. So about 25 years ago, we started doing some no-till on our farm and we were told by many no-tillers at the time, oh, leave your stalk stand tall and that's great and you can plant then good in the spring that doesn't work at all. So what we found is those stalks tip over like Darren's talking about. They haven't broken down because we've had no heat between harvest and planting time. And then we're trying to go over those stalks and cut them in the spring with the planter. Doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. Once we switched to a chopping corn head, we found no-till worked a lot better, strip-till worked a lot better, and even conventional till, we break the residue down faster even with tillage. So we are real big believers in chopping corn heads on our farm. One last thing that you may be thinking, well, okay, say I don't have one of those, what do I do then? Can I just come back and chop the stalks later? You sure can. You sure can bring a stalk chopper and make another pass through the field. The problem is that takes a little time, it takes another piece of equipment, and then here's the other thing you've already run over a lot of those stalks and matted them down. So now you can't do a perfect job like you can if you can chop them right with the corn head. Well, we believe chopping corn heads are important for our farm, but another thing that's really important for any farm is having great weed control. We'll talk about how to stop this tough weed coming up later in the show. 
Do you feel like there's never enough time to get everything done before planning? The window for spring work is quick and unforgiving. Give yourself the upper hand with the ProTil High Performance High Speed Disc. More and more farmers agree the ProTil is the right tool for spring field conditions and heavy residue management. Zero maintenance bearings, independent disc technology, oversized pins and bushings allow the ProTil to handle whatever field or conditions you can throw at it. Degelman High Performance Equipment. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yield's what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Farmers across the country have put their confidence in the Roundup Ready Extend crop system. These are their experiences. My satisfaction with Extend the Max on controlling weeds is this is second to none. We had fine results on the weed side and we had excellent results on the yield side. It's taken down the weeds, cleaning the fields up. Our confidence is high. There's no reason not to have Extend the Max on your fields. Put it on challenging acres and they're clean. Ideal for herbicide applications, the Ultra Low Drift's large air inducted droplets were designed to eliminate driftable fines without sacrificing coverage. Its thick three-dimensional pattern creates multiple angles for the spray to cover the target. Hypro, helping you spray better. There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plan be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. AgroLiquid moves you closer to your target. One of the most important steps you need to take to increasing your yields is obviously to take a look at your whole fertility program. Well, what we find is the most efficient major nutrient or primary nutrient out of N, P, and K is usually potassium, especially in the Midwest. So today we're going to talk about not just parts per million of potassium, but also the base saturation K percentage. When we think about potassium, it's a very, very important nutrient. Obviously, it's one of the three primary nutrients. And one of the real keys this year in 2019 that we've seen with potassium shortages is lack of stock strength. And I've talked to so many farmers across the country, man, my stocks just didn't have much strength this year. And you think about the conditions that we had. We had extreme moisture in so much of the country and our root system just had a tough time growing in many cases and growing deep in a lot of cases. So we had shallow roots, we weren't pulling enough potassium in. And it's tricky because when you look at soil tests, you, it can be deceiving because potassium is on there in a couple different spots. Well, let's talk about that, Brian. Where do we really need to look to even know if we have enough potassium? All right, where Darren's going here is parts per million and percent base saturation K. So let me just explain the difference. Parts per million is just how much potassium is in the soil. The base saturation potassium percentage is how much potassium is there in ratio to some other nutrients. So the other nutrients in that base saturation test are hydrogen, magnesium, calcium, and sodium. And here's what ends up happening, especially in the northern part of the United States. There are some really heavy soils, and when there are really heavy soils, those soils hold a lot of stuff, right? Well they are going to hold a lot of calcium and a lot of magnesium in many cases. So what ends up happening is you might say, well, 300 parts per million of potassium is enough for any soil out there because when you take a look at the nutrient removal charts on how much a good corn crop is going to use or a good soybean crop is going to use, you go, wow, we don't need 300 parts per million because in effect that's 600 pounds per acre. We don't need that much, right? But what happens is if you've got so much calcium and so much magnesium in the soil, well, in ratio, you simply don't have enough potassium. And when you don't have enough potassium in ratio, it just doesn't get into the plant. Either the magnesium prevents it from getting into the plant or the calcium. All I know is we end up short 
in plant tissue analysis. We have poor stock strength. Even though the parts per million looks pretty good, if there isn't enough in ratio with the other nutrients, we've got a real problem. Well, the parts per million are really important. As Brian mentioned, you have to have a certain amount of nutrient out in the field at least. But then the other thing we're looking at is base saturation to find out, hey, what's the ratio out in our soil and will our root system be able to randomly find that potassium out in the soil? So when we think about base saturation percentages, we'd like to be at at least 4% potassium on our base saturation chart. So out of 100% of the binding sites, we want at least 4% of them to be potassium. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, I'm at four, I'm in great shape here for 500 bushel corn. Not necessarily. We would like to actually see that get up over six, probably even 7% base saturation K, where we're in a really good spot. Now, that said, if you have things that restrict your root growth, you're still not gonna be able to find that potassium. So you have to be really choosy about where you place potassium and what you're doing for practices out in that field so you can access the potassium. So Darren mentioned four, five, six, seven percent base saturation K. What I usually tell people is it all depends on your test and who's running that test. So we use Midwest Labs real commonly. Well, four percent up to eight percent, that's kind of the good range that we're looking for. Now here's one other thing that I want you to think about. We farm in the Western Corn Belt where at least half the years were really dry and there isn't enough water out there to support tremendously high yields. Well, fertility is ridiculously important, right? The whole thing is fertility is going into the plant with water. If you don't have as much water, well, how are you gonna get the same level of fertility in? It's just like if you're gonna take some medicine and you're gonna take it with a full glass of water. Well, the next day, you still need to take the same dose of medicine and you only have a half a glass of water there. Well, your concentration is twice as much. That's exactly what I'm trying to do in a lot of our soils on our farm. I'm trying to get that base saturation K level up a little bit higher. I wanna be up at that six, seven, eight percent because I'm going for 300, 350 bushel corn. If I was only going for 100 bushel corn, yeah, 4% uh, base saturation K, just fine. Even 200 bushel corn shouldn't be a real big problem. But especially where we're limited on moisture, that's where we wanna keep raising that base saturation K level, just because potassium goes into the plant with water. Now back to the parts per million discussion and comparing that to base saturation K, if you say, I've already got enough parts per million, now you're telling me I need to put even more out in my soil? Look, potassium in heavier soils, it just doesn't move that much. It's not going to leach away on you. So building up potassium is, is fine because it's going to stay in the soil. So if you don't use it all up this year, you can use it up down the road. And when you got a heavy, heavy soil like that, yeah, it might take a little more than 200 or 300 parts per million in your soil to get up to that base saturation level of 4% or beyond. And if you have a light soil, well, it's very easy to get your base saturation K percentage up there because a light soil doesn't hold much magnesium or calcium or anything else. So generally speaking, when we start talking really high parts per million levels, that's only in the heavy soils. And in the heavy soils, we're not worried about leaching that potassium out. Well, one thing we're worried about, regardless of which type of soil you have, is controlling our weed of the week. We'll show you how to do that later in the show. It starts with genetics, what you're made of. It takes agronomy. It's local. It's knowing your land and having the tools to put the right product in the right place. It's built on service with trust, grit, and determination. Because it turns out, what it takes to make the best product is a lot like what it takes to make a farmer. Golden Harvest, rooted in genetics, agronomy, and service. Tough, precise, efficient. Strip tillage with the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm. Learn more at soilwarrior.com slash agphd. Why do I farm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. Something I've known since I was my daughter's age. I think about what kind of farm I'm going to hand over to her. About how I can make it more successful, more sustainable. 
I talk to other farmers, with agronomists, and advisors to help me make better decisions, to figure out what's working for them, and how to make it work even better for my farm. Because when you farm, you have a responsibility to keep it growing. To look at a freshly planted field, a newborn calf, even your bottom line. Then ask yourself, how do I help this grow? How can I make it even more productive? I ask myself these questions every day. Because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still a farmer. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yields what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Each year, Darren and I get a lot of questions about strip tillage, so today we want to just talk a little about some of the, the differences between no-till, conventional till, and strip till. All right, first of all, there isn't one magic system. We're not saying, oh boy, everybody needs to go strip till. Nobody should be doing conventional till or no-till. That's not right at all. What we are saying is there are different ways that you can till that soil up, and you have to think about what's gonna work best for you. So for example, with strip tillage, there are a lot of advantages that I like. One, it's kind of a minimum tillage system. So I'm leaving a lot of residue out there to protect my soil from erosion. But the second point here is one that I really, really like. We were talking about potassium and we often talk about getting our base saturation up. The other thing that's important is having nutrient placement just right. And when we're doing strip tillage, we can place our nutrients right where we're going to plant our crop. That gives us a much better chance of root interception of nutrients and it's easier for those plants to take those things in. So we can have a nice concentration of nutrients right in that root zone and what we see as we do some digging, not just on our farm but around the country, we see where we're doing strip till and nutrient placement, we can have a bigger, more massive root system underneath our plant which leads to ultimately higher yields. So comparing strip till to no-till and conventional till versus no-till, the two big advantages advantages that strip till has is number one, like Darren said, that nutrient placement, now we can get it down in the ground. It's not just going to be a couple inches deep. We can get it way down there if we want to. That's awesome. So we can build up our deeper soil profile and better protect our nutrients. And then the other big thing is you're going to have a lot warmer soil right in that seed zone, right in the seed furrow area. It's going to be warmer because that was tilled right above it. Well, if you compare strip till to conventional till, the biggest advantage is strip till has there, the biggest advantage is it's just one pass, so that's really nice. You don't have to make a whole bunch of passes across the field, but the other thing is it is definitely a way to reduce erosion compared to conventional tillage because roughly two-thirds or three-quarters of the ground is completely untilled. You're only tilling where you're going to plant, and usually that's being done in 30-inch rows. Well, I sure like it on a wet year too, Brian, when you leave those strips out there where you've got the residue and you can still drive through a little tougher condition without creating a lot of compaction. Now, it's not a magic system and it's not like, oh boy, in 2019 when we were under two feet of water, it made any difference at all. I'm talking about when you have a little bit of moisture, you do have a little bit more forgiveness in strip tillage. I really do like that. And then the other thing is you're leaving that root ball from last year's crop out there to naturally decompose that helps build organic matter. So when we think about it, uh, instead of having to go complete no-till, I can still build organic matter to some degree in strip till, definitely a lot faster than I can in conventional tillage. Well, when Darren makes the comment, you're going to leave last year's root ball intact, that's assuming that you're planting and doing your strip till in between last year's rows. If you're trying to go right next to last year's rows, a little bit different story. But anyway, one of the big questions I get is fall versus spring strip till. Look, I don't care exactly when you do it, but the whole thing is if you want to go deep, well, fall is usually your best opportunity depending on where you farm. Our challenge in the spring is the ground is too cold, the ground is too wet, and by the time it gets fit down several inches in the ground, we could have been planting maybe days earlier. So we don't want to delay planting because we know that hurts yield. 
that's why we usually lean toward we want to get our strip till done in the fall. Plus, it's just getting that work out of the way. Now, personally, I like going down with either a deep shank going down to 8 or 10 inches deep or a deep coulter. Now, one of the things you can do with the coulter is you can spread that fertilizer out all the way in that channel. With the shank, you're probably just going to place that fertilizer down deep. So it kind of depends on where you need fertility. If you're running one inch or three inch soil tests going all the way down, then you can identify, all right, where's my big need in this overall zone and where should I really be placing that fertilizer? Well, there's certainly a lot of different ways that you can go with tillage. You can do conventional tillage, you can do no-till, or you can do strip-till. Uh, today we highlighted a few advantages and disadvantages of going the strip-till route. One thing that does change though, as you change your tillage practice, is how you're going to control weeds like our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Weed of the week is common burdock. Brian, this is one of the weeds that I really disliked growing up because we had a dog on our farm that would always find the common burdock. She would run through it, she had this long fur, and all of a sudden we'd have these big knots that we'd have to hold the dog down and try and clean out, and it was just no fun. And when you think of common burdock, it's the burrs, Brian, that really bothered me. Yeah, so it's kind of like cockleburr. Yeah, so it's kind of like cockleburr. I mean, there are a lot of plants that will have these burrs, so it's little spikes that can attach themselves to animal hair and when the animals are running through yeah that's really how this weed can spread now typically we're not seeing common burdock out in the field we usually see it in shelter belts so if you've got it in the shelter belt what we're generally going to talk about is a late fall or early spring application of 2,4-D. All right, now you may be thinking, well, wait a second, isn't it going to go to seed by then? Well, fortunately, common burdock has a two-year life cycle. It's a biennial plant. So in the first year, it just has basically a rosette, and the second year is when it's actually going to try to put on seed. So you've got some time to get after this, but the ideal stage to catch common burdock in is that rosette stage before it goes to seed. Yep, absolutely. And if you do happen to see this out in fields, our suggestions would be in corn. We like verdict the best. You got to follow up with status, maybe a little atrazine in there. In soybeans, I'd probably still use the three pre program. Roundup will kill this weed. So will 2,4-D, dicamba, liberty, all depends on the trait that you're using. And then in wheat, I'd probably start with sharpen down, follow with husky over the top. That's all the time we have for this week's Weed of the Week, but Iron Talk is coming up next. Seasons, weather patterns, pests, weeds, diseases, new trends, tools, and technology. While farming as we know it continues to change, NK corn and soybeans consistently deliver. With the latest technology, high-performing genetics, and uncompromised value, NK helps you take on these challenges by maximizing your profit potential. Every acre, every single seed. NK Seeds, delivering technology, genetics, and value. There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plan be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. AgroLiquid moves you closer to your target in 1949, Morton Buildings constructed our first machine storage building to establish our bond with the farming community. Since then, our relationship has grown 
and so have our product offerings. From the smallest specialized operation to the largest agricultural enterprise, we understand the needs of your business and continue to evolve to meet industry demands. Plus, when you build a Morton building, you're backed by the strongest warranty in the business. To learn more about the Morton Advantage, visit mortonbuildings.com. You spend all year working hard to get as much yield as possible at harvest. The last thing you want to do is put your grain in the bin and have it spoil before you take it to market. Introducing the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. Designed and built by a farmer looking for a low-cost monitoring solution for existing bins, the Grain Temp Guard tracks temperature and humidity with an alarm system to alert you when your grain exceeds safe thresholds. For more information on a system for your bins, visit farmshopmfg.com. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Avoid dry run failures with the new Hypro Force Field Pump. Providing the ultimate protection, this wet seal pump will save you on costly in-season downtime to keep your sprayer running. Now all you have to worry about is the weather. Hypro, helping you spray better. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. At Harvest, you have one goal, finding the perfect flow of grain from the field to the bend. Case IH Axial Flow Combines are engineered for matched capacity to deliver proven grain savings so you can keep efficiency flowing smoothly. Find yours with the Case IH Axial Flow. Midwestern corn harvest is behind schedule this year, and most farmers would like to harvest dry corn, but not too dry. So we'll talk about how corn that's too dry can be a problem in today's Iron Talk. You're probably thinking, dry corn is not a problem. It's a great deal. All right, you got me there. Yep, it saves you money when you don't have to dry the corn down. My argument, though, is that it may cost you money if you let the corn get too dry in the field. What I'm talking about here is shatter loss. With shatter loss during corn harvesting, there are a couple of obvious points to make. First, harvesting at 20 to 24% moisture or even a little bit wetter reduces harvest loss tremendously. In an ideal world, that's when we would try to harvest everything on our farm to maximize yield and minimize problems. Now, the second thing, when corn does get really dry and it gets below 20% moisture, shatter becomes more of an issue. Every kernel that doesn't make it into the combine is a potential volunteer corn plant in your field for next growing season. Now, the weed competition definitely costs you yield, and the weeds themselves, volunteer corn, cost you money to control. If you're continually running into problems on your farm with grain getting too dry in the field before harvest, or if you're one of the farmers that actually targets 14 to 17 percent corn and you're waiting for that to begin your harvest, there are different fixes available for nearly every kind of harvesting machine. Now, the first step would be to speak with your equipment dealer for upgrades or modifications you can make to your specific brand of harvesting equipment. Secondly, there are aftermarket fixes advertising up to an 80% reduction in shatter loss at the header. If you don't think you can afford to fix things, stop and consider the economic loss that you're seeing in the field. Using the Ag PhD Harvest Loss Calculator, two kernels of corn per square foot on the ground equals about one bushel of yield loss. Now, let's say you're losing three bushels per acre on 1,000 acres. Well, that's more than a $10,000 loss for your farm. And this doesn't even include the expense of a volunteer corn herbicide for your next crop. Shatter loss is a serious concern in corn, especially when corn gets too dry. So do some harvest loss counts on your farm this fall and look into the fixes to put this lost income back into your pocket. That's all the time for today's Iron Talk, but now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD radio show. You'll find us on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central each weekday. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Read of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.